Welcome. I'm Eric Fleming, host of A Moment with Eric Fleming, the podcast of our time. I want to personally thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, then I need you to do a few things. First, I need subscribers. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash a moment with Eric Fleming. Your subscription allows an independent podcaster like me the freedom to speak truth to power and to expand and improve the show. Second, leave a five-star review for the podcast on the streaming service you listen to it. That will help the podcast tremendously. Third, go to the website, momenteric.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast, leave reviews and comments, listen to past episodes, and even learn a little bit about your host. Lastly, don't keep this a secret like it's your own personal guilty pleasure. Tell someone else about the podcast. Encourage others to listen to the podcast and share the podcast on your social media platforms because it is time to make this moment a movement. Thanks in advance for supporting the podcast of our time. I hope you enjoy this episode as well. Welcome to another moment with Eric Fleming. I am your host, Eric Fleming. And ladies and gentlemen, what a great show we have for you today. I've got some guests on uh, that I hope will enlighten you on several different subjects. Uh, As we're approaching 2024, a lot of these topics that's going to be covered today are going to play a major role in the election in 2024. And so I have been very fortunate that I have some guests to come on to talk about some of those topics. So get ready for a very, very entertaining and educational show. But before we get into all that, it's time for a moment of news with Grace G. Thanks, Eric. Republican U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville lifted his hold on some military promotions, leading to the confirmation of hundreds of stalled promotions by the Senate's Democratic Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Ousted U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy announced he will leave Congress at the end of the year, raising concerns among Republicans about their narrow majority. A U.S. judge ruled that former President Donald Trump does not have immunity from criminal charges related to his actions during his presidency, and he must face civil lawsuits over his role in the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol. Republican former U.S. Representative Liz Cheney, a critic of Donald Trump, said she is considering a third-party bid for the White House in 2024. Georgia Republicans proposed a new map for the U.S. House districts in the state for the 2024 election, which includes a new majority black district, but also dismantles a multiracial district currently held by a Democratic representative. A Florida appeals court upheld the state's congressional map, which a lower court ruled violated the state's constitution by diminishing the voting power of some black residents. A group of Catholic nuns sued the board of Smith & Wesson to try to force the gunmaker to stop manufacturing, marketing, and selling assault-style rifles. An inmate who stabbed Derek Chauvin 22 times was charged with attempted murder. Texas has been ordered by a U.S. appeals court to remove a floating barrier it placed in the Rio Grande to deter migrants from crossing the border with Mexico. President Biden announced his administration has approved $4.8 billion in student debt cancellation for 80,300 Americans. Nearly 7.3 million Americans have signed up for health insurance for next year through the Affordable Care Act's marketplace. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum ended his campaign for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. And former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor died at the age of 93. I am Grace G, and this has been a moment of news. All 
All right. Thank you, Grace, for that moment of news. And now it is time for our first guest. Dan McMillan founded and leads Save Democracy in America, a nonpartisan campaign to get big money out of politics. He earned a Ph.D. in German history from Columbia and a law degree from Fordham. He has taught college level history and prosecuted criminal cases for the Brooklyn DA's office. In 2014, Dan published an acclaimed book for the general public about why the Holocaust happened. After several years researching a book about money and politics, Dan decided that direct political action was more urgently needed and launched his campaign for voter-owned elections. A dedicated rock climber in his youth, Dan has made three ascents of El Capitan in Yosemite Valley, the highest rock wall in North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Dan McMillan. All right, Dan McMillan, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing terrific, Eric. It's good to be with you. Well, it's an honor to have you on. Uh, I'm glad you accepted my request um, because I want to talk to you about money in politics. And that's something that's kind of near and dear to me because I actually had to go through the process of raising money to campaign and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I want to highlight the work that you're doing dealing with that. But before we get started, Uh, what I usually try to do if I can is to find a quote that's related to the person that I'm interviewing and it's either something they may have written or something, uh, that, uh, relates to the work or, or whatever. So your quote is this, and it's, it's coming from, uh, a book that you wrote, but I think it ties into what we're going to discuss, uh, today says, one problem with making moral compromises is that doing the right thing becomes increasingly difficult. It requires admitting that one's earlier acts were wrong. In effect, to get clean, one must first get dirtier, a step that few prove willing to take. What's your, what's your take on that quote? Well, thank you so much for, for looking at my book on the causes of the Holocaust. And I was, you know, the the quote originally refers to the moral compromises Germans made during the 1930s as their Jewish neighbors and co-workers were persecuted and as these Germans accepted this. But I guess it's especially applicable today, uh, not that I want to suggest that our, our the people in Washington are, per, are like Holocaust perpetrators, but I think people have been working in government, and this has been going on for decades, they may have gone to Washington with good intentions, but they quickly find out if they haven't already learned that the most important skill they have is raising money, is going to various kinds of special interests, wealthy people to ask for money, Uh, particularly if you're in the House of Representatives, no sooner have you finished, you know, succeeded in one re-election campaign, the next day you're making phone calls to raise money for your next re-election campaign, which is only two years down the road. And in the process, you compromise. And you, you, you may have gone to Washington, you probably did go to Washington to serve the American people the way it's supposed to be in our constitution. But over time, and actually pretty quickly, you, without even, even necessarily knowing what you're doing, you come to accept that your true constituents are your donors rather than voters. Those are the people you listen to. Those are the people you answer to. Those are the people you think about. Those are the ones that you take care of. And Eventually, you forget, and I think most of them in Washington have entirely forgotten what what democracy means. I mean, they talk about the word democracy it means government by the people, but to them, their donors or their constituents, and we, the people, are a nuisance. You know, we're we're a necessary evil. They still need our our vote to get into office, but. What they really need is some far more urgently is the money, the campaign cash, without which they cannot ask anyone for their vote. And so over time, I think it has corrupted them all morally so so dramatically that 
they don't even know which end is up anymore. They've, they've entirely lost perspective. And there's just no way to turn back. And you try to, even people who are retired from public office, uh, I see this, I've, I've seen this in the memoirs of retired politicians. They don't want to talk. They don't even acknowledge how important fundraising was in their careers, particularly in the later stages. Or if they mention it, they try to play it down and say that it wasn't important, which is just completely dishonest. Because who can, who, you know, later in life wants to accept that they've been living a lie? It's exactly, they'd have to get dirty again, very dirty, in order to get clean. And by that point, they've, 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 they've compromised themselves and they've weakened themselves morally so badly that there's no turning back for them. And I don't say this to demonize them. It's not that these are bad people. Like, like the men who perpetrated the Holocaust, most of these people were at one point perfectly normal, morally good, not corrupt. Um, but circumstances, you know, do corrupt them. I mean, people have free will. We're responsible for our choices. It's also true that if you put people in the wrong situation with the wrong incentives, you're going to get people doing bad things. And uh, we certainly have that. I mean, in this today, we have a we have a, a federal government that is kind of collapsing in slow motion before our very eyes. And but the good news is that we, the people, by and large, um, because politics is not our lives, we're not corrupted. Uh, we've had our we've had our heads filled with some poison from people in the media and people in politics. But fundamentally, I think the American people across the board politically still very much believe in the ideals on which the country was founded, want our country to live up to those ideals. And I think that once they, once Americans see sort of where this problem came from and how to fix it, um, then I think that we, the people, will rise up and fix it. Yeah, so in the part of your answer, it reminded me of something I used to tell my colleagues and, and people wanting to be in politics is that there is a line as far as morals go. And, you know, everybody has different morals, so they have a different line. But every now and then you see that you have to reach over that line in order to get certain things done for your people. The danger yeah. becomes you keep going over the line so much, eventually you cross that line and then it's like it's, it becomes a wall at that point and you can't come back. And that was something That's I always right. used to tell folks. It's like, just be careful, you know, just regardless of your political affiliation and all that, you have your personal moral limit and don't compromise that in order to achieve what you want to achieve. That's very well put. I think that's very apt. The, the one thing I would add to that as a refinement is that at, as the cost of election campaigns rises, and it's it's risen steeply since the early 1980s, and it's skyrocketed since Citizens United in 2010, that the line itself keeps getting moved, <laughs> you know, right. and sort of the line between ex can, what people around you accept as moral behavior keeps getting pushed out further and further and further. It's kind of the opposite of moving the goalposts. It's in a negative way. It's kind of where the floor keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And then you just, you, you've sunk so low, you have no idea which way is up anymore. Um, but that's a, that's a good way of putting it, yes. So what started your fascination uh, with the influence of money in politics? That wasn't exactly what you, you, you were into initially as far as your research and, and your your study what what got you fascinated with how politics the influence of money in politics and trying to do something about it well you know I, i've been following american politics since i turned 20 in 1980 and already by the mid 80s it was clear something was wrong but and people around me were all saying something was wrong and people were saying things like you know, I, I can go to the polls and vote, but I don't have much to vote for. The whole political conversation seemed phony and dishonest and detached from reality. Um, I mean, yes, my first career, as you point out, I was I was an academic historian. I taught German history. 
in college. And that's why I ended up writing a book about the Holocaust. But I also followed American politics, you know, with, with much interest. I'm trying to think of when I really, uh, I know one event that really got me was Bill Clinton's 50th birthday party. <laughs> and it was at like a fundraising event where all these Democratic Barney donors contributed a huge amount, I think, to what was going to be his reelection campaign, I think, in 1996. Um, and it was actually, on the, I think it was the, the front page of the New York Post, which has great headlines. And it was a picture, photograph of Bill Clinton about to blow out a cake. And the headline was Dollar Bill. And it kind of clicked. It said, wait a minute. These campaigns are expensive. The candidates get the money for these campaigns. Not from me, because I don't have to, I don't have it to give, but from people who can give it in bulk. Uh, I guess those people have a lot more say in government than I do. And that's kind of where I began to focus on it. Uh, but really, I went into high gear. The Citizens United decision was 2010. That kind of opened the floodgates, has opened the floodgates. And that, at that point, I was writing my book on the Holocaust. But once I got through an advanced draft, I began working as a sort of back burner project on um, understanding the damage done by money in politics and how to fix it. And by the spring of, but come the spin, I've, I've written, done a lot of research and I've written a couple hundred pages in different pockets and parts of chapters. By the spring of 2020, two things became clear. One was all kinds of really smart people, people smarter than I had written very good books on different aspects of money in politics. And the books hadn't moved the needle politically at all. A second was, you know, in the Democratic primary, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren made noise about money in politics. And that was worth something. But then they turned around and said, and we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, which, you know, as you know, you know, when you know how hard it is to, to amend our constitution and with the country this polarized, that's just an empty gesture. And at the same time, I knew perfectly well that these candidates were well aware of the of a, a partial solution to this problem, which is the one that I promote in my organization, what's been called democracy dollars or voter-owned elections. And it's simply the, and you don't need to amend the constitution. All you need is an act of Congress. And it's just the idea is that the government would give money to each registered voter to assign to candidates. Um, so it's a public financing mechanism where the voters allocate the money to candidates. And we could do that. We don't have to wait to amend the Constitution. You could do that through act of Congress. But they didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about something that was impossible. And then I saw, well, you know, you hear a lot about how Sanders and Warren had more small dollar money than anyone else, small dollar donors. But they also had their share of big dollar donors. and that's when it became clear that no help is going to come from Washington, from within the system for this, because politicians are too busy raising this money and uh, to fight against the money. And so therefore, the will, the political will for changing this has got to come from the people and the leadership for it has got to come from outsiders to the system like myself and, and hundreds of others people kind of like me around the country who are promoting this reform, like usually mostly at the municipal level uh, and some at the state level. I'm the one who's kind of making the running for a federal uh, voter-owned election system, but basically there's, there's really thousands of us actually that are all in this fight uh, around the country. And it is it is picking up steam. We've won some victories at the local level. and uh, But anyway, so, uh, but I should let you talk. Uh, well, no, I'm interviewing you. I, I want you to talk, but... Um... I guess we, let me talk to me about how big money in politics helps maintain racism and, and other kind of prejudices. Cause you talked about how polarized the country is, but you believe that, that, that the big money in politics is helping exacerbate that division. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. You know, I think that, one one sort of part of American political history, and it goes back to the 17th century already, is that divide and conquer has been a mechanism by which sort of you know money powerful moneyed interests have stayed on top in our country. Uh, you know by divide and it's 
precisely in our country is so strong because we're the most diverse uh, of the world's democracies and perhaps probably the most diverse society of any kind. And so it was always possible for people to divide the, the working class against itself, uh, first black against white, but then as once we had massive immigration, then immigrant versus American born, all the different ethnic groups by religion and so on. And it just is, it has different versions down through the centuries, but it's gotten more and more intense because the, um, the demands of fundraising have gotten more intense. I mean, the last three federal election cycles, uh, each shattered previous fundraising records right now, to, to win a seat in the House of Representatives, you need to raise millions. I think at least 2 million. The minimum price of admission to the Senate is 10 million. I think races of 30 or 40 million are much more typical. Um, in the runoffs in 2020, where John Ossoff and uh, Raphael Warnock won, I think the total spent by all candidates was 440 million. Um, and of course, uh, Joe Biden is, his finance chair is, is proudly boasting they're going to raise 2 billion for the reelection campaign. I doubt very much that Donald Trump's going to raise any less. Um, and so for that reason, now the, the parties, as the parties are more and more thoroughly sort of owned by money and special interests, the less and less they have to offer the rest of us. And now really, I mean, you, you have what's so interesting about the anger in our politics and the, the impression you get when you look at politics and, and, and listen to, to people in politics of this of this country of, that that Americans you get the impression that half the country eats the other half and all these different groups hate each other, and I don't deny that these prejudices are there, but on the other hand, one of the things I hear from talking to people all across the spectrum politically is you know this anger in Washington is strange to me because we all want the same things, you know we all want. Uh, a living wage for a 40 hour week. We want our kids to have a decent shot at climbing the economic ladder. I want decent schools for my kids. I want to go to a doctor without having to worry about going bankrupt. I want a safe and clean environment for my kids to grow up and my grandkids. Um, you know, and I don't think our fundamental values differ all that much, but as now that the parties have almost nothing to offer us, they've got, neither party's got a plan for affordable health care. Um, Nope, no one's talked about any way of rebuilding the middle class in a way that's at all plausible. They're not offering anything to us. And so they need to distract us uh, and, and also divide us. They keep their own uh, base in line by, by demonizing the other side, you know, encouraging Republicans and Democrats to fear and hate each other. And they also play upon the prejudices that we already have. Um, I guess one way of putting this, this is sort of a, this is obviously a very gross oversimplification, but, you know, the, a, a Republican message for quite some time now has been, your problem is not the Wall Street firms that pay for my campaign and all of my colleagues' campaigns and that crash the economy in 08, so you might have lost your home in a foreclosure and who won't pay their fair share as taxes so that your small business is stuck holding the bag. Your problem is is minorities who suck up your tax dollars by plunging off the government. Your problem is immigrants who want to take your job. Your problem is the godless supporter of abortion on demand uh, who has no respect for your religious faith. And the democratic message is, you know, your problem is not these Wall Street firms, which of course gave Hillary Clinton a ton of money in 16. Your problem is the racist gun-toting redneck uh, who will always hate you because of the color of your skin or who you love, who could care less if your child is slaughtered in a school shooting, who wants to ram his Christian faith down your throat. And I'm not saying that guns aren't important or immigration isn't important or the place of religion in American life isn't important. These are all important issues. It's also true. Both parties milk these issues for anger. Um, so I think it's, it's a divide and conquer mechanism. It's also because now, you know, because it's so expensive to run when they get to D.C., all our so-called representatives are hogtied by all the favors. They owe all the different special interests. And by censoring themselves to avoid alienating any potential source of campaign cash. So they can't really both parties in theory have a program. 
for a better future, but they don't have a deliverable program, an achievable program. Or another way to put it is that for every good idea that any of us may have, you know, and there are people on both sides of the aisle who've got good ideas, you know, for to spend our money more effectively or to, you know, get us get us affordable health care. I think that's one of the most urgent things. But for every good idea, there's going to be a group of donors who can block it, who will block it. And, and decreasingly, they don't even they don't even have to try to block it because the politicians already know if I start moving in that direction, that person will give to my campaign and then I lose I lose my 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 perch in Washington. We have a government that effectively is paralyzed by interest group goodlock and having so little positive to deliver, both parties have defaulted to negative messaging. And, you know, it seems to me, I mean, I have I don't know that anyone's quantified this, but across the last three federal cycles, it feels like the messaging has just gotten relentlessly more and more negative. It's like all you hear when I talk to Americans on both sides of the aisle, they say to me, gosh, I get all this, these TV ads, all they do is tear down their opponent. They don't tell me what they're going to do for me. And, you know, in 2020, the, in the presidential race in 2020, and now in 2024 coming up, you know, if you boil down the top line message of both parties to its essentials, it's identical. If the other side wins, the world's going to end. Now, that is not a message of hope for, the, for us. It's not a plan for a better future. It's an admission of defeat, of failure. It's a, de it's a declaration of bankruptcy by the entire ruling class of our country. Now, they're, they're still happily unaware that they've declared bankruptcy, but they have. The good news is that I think that we, the people, do understand that. You know, and, you know, you, we've been, Americans have been saying, I mean, people I've talked to, already back in the 80s, but more and more, you know, as, as the time goes on, this isn't working. I'm fed up with politics as usual. I want change, especially beginning in, in 08 with President Obama. Uh, we've given our, our votes to candidates who promise systemic fundamental change, but with no specifics, you know, hope and change. And in 2016, Trump says he's going to drain the swamp. Sanders says he's going to give us a revolution. Sanders is there with his revolution again in 2020. None of these candidates has a plan for change for us. And that's because what needs changing is money in politics, is our government being for sale to donors. And no candidate can fight the money because they're too busy raising it. And so my theory of how we win this, how we turn this around and reclaim, you know, take our country clap back and reestablish re government by the people here in the land of its birth is really that this vote around elections reform that I've dedicated my life to promoting and building support for among Americans, left, right, and center, that this is what was missing. This is the missing plan for change. This is the, because you can't, you can't rally people without a concrete actionable demand. These can't these so-called change candidates never gave us an actionable demand, an achievable goal that would bring the change about. This voter owned elections reform uh, and it has demonstrated cross-partisan support. Um, I, I commissioned a poll in June in New Hampshire of 700 New Hampshire voters and found you know, just outrage across the board, left, right, and center about money and politics, a receptive audience for this idea. I've had more than 70 interviews on radio, TV, and podcast across the board politically, uh, probably about two-thirds conservative because talk radio leans conservative. And I'm getting a warm response all the way through. And just also in hundreds and hundreds of conversations one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with Americans from all walks of life and, and all politics, political stripes. Um, because this is, and it's not surprising to me, A, because we're all fed up, B, because this reform is very common sense and easy to explain, make the voters the donors, you know? Um, and because, and best of all for me, and what's, what inspires me to do this is this is about one of the ideals that make us Americans, you know, government by the people, which we invented. And you look at all this anger in our politics, and we, we tear our hair out and ask, how are we going to overcome this anger? And how do we bring Americans together? To me, it's staring us straight in the face. We're the only country on earth that stands for ideals. And no matter how often we've portrayed these ideals, and we have very often, 
But nonetheless, you know, again and again, Americans return to the fight to make these ideals a reality. You saw this particularly in the civil rights movement, the way that I'm talking now about American ideals and what the country stands for. Actually, so much of my messaging is taken directly from Dr. King and President Kennedy promoting civil rights that it's, you know, you know, Dr. King, it was so what he said from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And he put his finger on what made this a country unlike any other. We have a creed that makes us a people, a nation, you know, individual freedom, equality of opportunity, governed by the people. And our creed is, but he also reminded us, our creed is not just a reason to be proud of ourselves, although it is that. And it, it certainly gives me a lot of pride in our country, but it's also a bar that we wanna do harder to live up to. And once we hit that bar, then we raise it again, because that's, it's, you know, our ideals make us Americans. Fighting for these ideals is what Americans do. And that's why at the end of the day, although, I don't deny that sometimes I too get discouraged when I look at our politics. I feel that once we get the word out and then enough Americans see that, okay, I understand how this was done to me. I understand why I'm getting stiffed. It's money in politics. And okay, this voter elections is not gonna be a complete solution, but we don't have to solve it all today. We can just start moving in the right direction. I just don't see that the American people are gonna continue to take this line down. That just is not plausible to me. So in a capitalist society, right, how can, yes. you, how can you regulate the influence of money? And the reason why I'm asking that is because, you know, it's one thing for politicians to ask for the money. Yeah. But, you know, there's a reason why campaigns cost so much. It's like you have media demands that they get paid for commercials. And then you 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 know, you got to pay people to give you ideas to put ads on the commercials, right? I mean, you know, put together the ads for the commercials. And then you, yeah. you, uh, kind of a phenomenon in the black community, as far as like local politics goes, which I dealt with as a state representative, is that every church or if they're having an anniversary or something, they want you to buy an ad in the, in the program book, Right. So that's yeah. that's anywhere from twenty five to five hundred dollars. It doesn't matter. Or you buy 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 a table at a banquet and all this stuff. So yeah. it's like everybody in this capitalist society has got their hand out, right? Yeah. And so that's why all these politicians are like, you know, I think I think you got to pay to to carve butter at the Iowa State Fair. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you do. No, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the candidates the candidates are asking for the money because people are asking them for the money to give them the privilege to 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 boast about their campaign and, and convince people to vote for them. So in a capitalist society, how do you how do you manage all of that? Well, one thing I would say is I don't know that capitalism is the problem because. We didn't, we didn't like, I would say from about 1910 to maybe 1980, although money was always important, it didn't, it wasn't just so uncontrollable like it is today. And that was a legal shift. And we were very much capitalist society in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. In fact, I would say we were more capitalist then than we are now because you had really more free markets as opposed to now what we have is rigged monopoly markets because of all the influence that companies can buy in government. The real turning point, one of the turning points in 1976 was a really dumb Supreme Court decision that's kind of the father or the mother of Citizens United. It's called Buckley v. Vallejo. And that was where the court decided that that money spent to influence elections in a donation or buying an ad is itself free speech. Up to that point, free speech in our country and every country just meant what you and I are doing now. We state our views. It didn't mean money that you could spend to buy an audience for your speech, like by buying advertisements or to drown out everyone else's speech, which is basically what special interests and billionaires do today with campaign contributions. But the court decided what the court decided and we're stuck with it. And that's why we're the only wealthy society that are pretty much pretty much or close to the only that does not limit the cost of election campaigns. And that's why our election campaigns are 
massively higher. I mean, I would say at least as ten, at least ten times as expensive as say a parliamentary election in Germany or Canada. Probably ten is a, is actually an understatement. But so we can't stop that. The, these election campaigns are massively expensive, but we can control in a way where the candidates get this money. Now, strictly speaking, thanks to the court, because they don't want to hurt anyone's free speech. They don't want to impinge on the on the free speech of these poor massive corporations and billionaires who who can't get a hearing for their ideas. So strictly speaking, we can't we can't stop them legally from throwing money at politicians. But let's one of the things about this reform is um, if we have this system where every voter gets, you know, an allotment of campaign cash. And if you fund this robustly, which we'd have to, uh, I think $100 per voter in a presidential year, $50 for the midterms. You know, if you wanted to run for Congress, Eric, I mean, right now it's hard to run for Congress if you're not a millionaire. It's almost impossible. And you need millionaire friends. So you can hold a fundraiser at the country club where you all belong. But going forward, we can have Americans of all walks of life. And, you know, anyone like, you know, like you, for example, you already have, you have the communication skills. And if you have some ideas and the gumption to lead, you can start going out and gathering, you know, getting some volunteers to knock on doors and gathering voter dollars from the voters. And then if your opponent decides to, to continue funding their campaign the old way, you know, by taking money from big farm and big oil or from some billionaire, then you can say to the voters, well, my opponent wants to be a stooge for corporate interests. I want to serve you. And that's why I take I fund my campaign through the public voter owned election system. In that scenario, I would much rather be you than the, your opponent. So strictly speaking, does, can we guarantee, is this going to drive all the money out of the system? Probably not, but it will definitely level the playing field enough that we can start getting a lot of people now in government who really are dedicated to serving us, who are not torn between you know, serving two masters. We can start having an open and honest conversation about all the issues. And above all, we can have a conversation where all policy ideas are on the table again, because right now, most of the good ideas for addressing the country's challenges and, and seizing our opportunities are not even in people's minds, because any, any idea, any policy idea that might alienate some donor is automatically out of, is censored automatically. People work in politics, they get into the habit of censoring themselves. Well, you've worked in politics. I think you know exactly how that goes. Uh, so we talked much about so. it earlier, about, about, about being sucked toward that line that you shouldn't cross. And right. that's part of how that process works. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 we're up against it, but I just wanted to say something because I, I had to, well, I didn't have to, but I ran for the United States Senate twice. And one of the jokes at a national conference I was attending was that, uh, you know, I sat down with breakfast with some other legislators and they were like going, oh, yeah, you're running for the Senate. Yeah. Hey, guys, he's a millionaire. And I was like, no, no, I'm not a millionaire. And the guy said, oh, I apologize. He's a billionaire, y'all. He's running for the U.S. Senate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I definitely understand that. And and one of the things going through that experience, I wrote a blog article saying, well, maybe we should restrict fundraising at the federal level to just the election year and do it twice that year, like one to cover the primaries and one to cover the yeah. general election. Is it even, even with the, I mean, would that be helpful? Cause to me, it's like, like you said, the minute that you get into office, you got to have your, you got to start picking your staff to do quote unquote policy stuff, but then you've got to maintain your campaign apparatus because you've got to constantly raise money 24 seven. And to yeah. me, that's a distraction from doing the policy stuff because you want to keep the money coming and you want to get reelected. So you, you probably won't push for certain things that you think is going to cut off the money. So my thing is my idea was just, just limit them to raising money the year they got to run. I mean, it's enough that they've got to run in, in the House of Representatives every two years. But it seems to me that that, that should be 
something to try to take away the disadvantage that the incumbents have over challengers for their seats? Well, I mean, it's a great idea, but that's you're restricting the fundraising. That's exactly what the Supreme Court won't let us do. And because they would say you're restricting someone's free speech. And that's that's why really the only path you know, to, to really changing the rules of the game is some kind of public financing mechanism. And there are other kinds of mechanisms, like there's some states that have like a complicated, you can apply for a lump sum grant to your campaign. But this I think is better because it's it's just, on, it's very simple to administer and you can't rig it or corrupt it because that this decision about which candidate gets how much money is decentralized to 168 million registered voters. So how do you rig that? It's just easier to create. And also what's really valuable about this politically is the way that it directly empowers each voter. Because right now, so many of us feel disempowered and frustrated and thwarted. A lot of us have tuned out politics entirely because we think it's hopeless. And this is a way to say to every American, no. And candidates are going to have to come to you, not just for your vote, but for something they need a lot more desperately than your vote, you know, the cash without which they don't have a viable campaign. And now you're in the driver's seat and the way the where you ought to be, you know, the where the, the way it says in our Constitution, you know, as it as our country stands for. So and that's another reason why I think that we can rally people to this reform. So how do people get involved with your organization and 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 push this idea so please you know go to my website the url is a little long i'll say it twice it's save democracy in america.org save democracy in america.org although if you just google dan mcmillan money and politics or something you'll you'll find me also uh and it's got some some a couple of videos that explain the concept, uh, links to my media interviews, some FAQs, some other information. Um, I used to ask people to donate money. I've I've taken I've removed the donate button. What I really want from everyone and what everyone can supply is validation for this idea. That is to say, to share this, share our website, our videos, or just uh, talk with friends, people you know, if about this conversation. Uh, and just encourage people to check it out, even if you're not yet sold on this idea. And it's a, look, this is a very new idea with big implications. You don't win everyone over the first time they hear it. It's going to take repetition. But the thing is, you know, I go on radio, TV, I speak in person, I make my best case. But the people in the audience don't know me from Adam. But people who know you personally, with them, our message about breaking big money in politics, taking our country back, is a hundred times more powerful coming from you than it will ever be coming from me. And that's my message to everyone is we're not powerless. We're not B. They still need our vote. You absolutely can move the ball down the field. If you if you feel like spending just 10 minutes a week helping us get the word out, because that's really how we win this. We get enough Americans to hear about it enough times, and especially just your seal of approval, the validation that you can give to this so that people see oh, this is something that could happen. This is real. You know, this makes sense. Uh, so I really encourage you to do that. If you can, I'd be very grateful. Well, Dan, I, I wish you well on on this effort to continue to make our process more democratic. Um, I thank you for coming on this podcast and uh, look forward to talking with you again. I would like that very much, Eric. Thank you very much for this opportunity. All right, guys. We're going to catch y'all on the other side. All right, and so we're back. So I hope that you felt Dan McMillan's passion when it comes to money in politics and the fact that we need to address it, right? Um, and, you know, like I said, he here's a guy who was basically a historian who read a book and decided, yeah, I, there's something that needs to be done about this. 
And so now he's on a mission to, to fix the problem. So y'all pay attention to that. Pay attention to, well, the, the old saying, follow the money. And just kind of watch how this develops in 2024. You, you may understand why some of these folks that don't really have a shot of being president or anything are running anyway, right? Just follow the money. Okay. So now let's get to our next guest, whose also name is Dan. His name is Dan McClellan, and he is a public facing scholar of the Bible and religion. He received his PhD in theology and religion from the University of Exeter, and his research focuses on conceptualizations of deity, scripture, and religious identity through the methodological lenses of biblical criticism cognitive linguistics, and the cognitive science of religion. In 2022, he published a revised version of his dissertation as the open access volume, YHWH's Divine Images, a cognitive approach. Dan produces content on social media that increases public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and combats the spread of misinformation about the same. He is also one of two Dans who hosts the Data Over Dogma podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this program, Dan McClellan. All right, Dan McClellan. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the invitation to join you. Well, I am honored to have smart people on this podcast. Uh, I have heard you on a couple other podcasts, and I said, ooh, if I can get him on, he'll probably make me look good just the way he'll answer my little simple questions, right? Um, well, let's hope we can do that. Yeah, and I know your expertise is in religious studies, and so that's why I wanted to focus in on of course, this is a mm -hmm. political show, so we'll wrap some politics into it. But okay. um, I wanted—I I definitely I always try to reach out to people in 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 the religious sector because I think religion plays a major part in our American politics. So, but before we get into the conversation, I guess, or my my interrogation or whatever, I ask. I usually give out a quote that either that person has said or is related to their work or written or whatever and mm -hmm. uh, want them to get their takes on it. And your quote is really, really simple. It is, a, it is something I found on your Twitter feed. And it mm -hmm. said, putting principles over party does not compute for some folks. <laughs> explain, uh, explain that quote for me. Um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the exact circumstance. I think it has to do with uh, I think it may have had to do with Mitt Romney. Um, there was a uh, another politician who was uh, who was coming after, if if I remember correctly, Mitt Romney primarily because of his uh, vote to um, against Donald Trump uh, in his impeachment hearing and. What I was trying to to highlight there was this disconnect where this other politician was trying to advance the interests of their party uh, by condemning a member of their party for standing upon his own principles and voting against uh, Donald Trump in the impeachment hearing. And it seems so clear to me that this politician cared far more about the success and the standing of his party than he did about the nation's health, than the uh, the progress of the nation, than the well-being of the people. And and I'm I live in Utah, and that's something that we have to deal with an awful lot here. There are an awful lot of legislators who will promote the needs and the interests and and the access to power of their party directly over and against the needs and even the expressed will of the people. Uh, for instance, several years, not several years ago, just a few years ago, we ran a bunch of referenda. Uh, we had a referendum to create an independence redistricting committee. 
uh, to try to mitigate the effect of uh, gerrymandering in our state. We had a referendum on um, uh, medical cannabis. We had a referendum on closing the Medicaid gap. And we passed all of these things. And then in the very next legislative session, the state legislature one by one overturned the expressed will of the people uh, because these were things that went against the interests of the state uh, GOP. And so even when the people stand up and say, this is what we want, uh, many of our legislators say, no, our party bosses want something different and that's whose interests we serve. And, and I think I was probably responding to somebody who was giving Mitt Romney a hard time just because Mitt Romney felt like Donald Trump was guilty of the uh, the indiscretions of which he was accused. And uh, and it just baffles me that so many folks are uh, think that somebody is unfit for office because they stand on principle, even if it, when it goes against the interests of the party. But that's I think that's precisely the kind of politician we need, somebody who will put their principles ahead of uh, their party. So should religion and, 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 and the reason why it's really become, well, it's been an issue for a while, um, but it really throughout the history of the nation, but because Mike Johnson's ascension to sp the speakership, the media has really harped in on him and his faith or his expressions mm -hmm. of faith, even in his acceptance speech, you know, it was very, very, uh, uh, God themed, right. For lack of a mm -hmm. more articulate term. So should religion have an impact on public policy and why, or why not? Well, I think the, uh, the founders of, of the nation were advocates for enlightenment rationality. And, and I think in that period, the most common ideology was, was kind of a rational approach to religion uh, over and against what they called revealed religion. And so the, the separation of church and state was, was important for them. And, and I don't think you can entirely um, compartmentalize the influence of what we label religion from um, structures of, of power, whether, whether on a local or state or, or a federal level. I, I don't think you can entirely uh, separate the two, but I think the ideal ought to be towards that separation because the, the, the organs of state are supposed to be, and according to the founders of our nation, are supposed to be aimed at serving the interests of the whole. Um, as a collective, and then to the degree possible, uh, serving the interests of the individuals, or at least weighing the interests of, of individuals uh, against each other. And, and when religion influences things, that undermines those efforts directly. I've, I've heard, and something Mike Johnson said was their goal was to keep government from meddling in religion, not the other way around, which I think is asinine because you cannot allow religion to meddle in government without government meddling in religion because religion meddling in government means government is giving priority to certain religious traditions through to certain expressions of, of religious belief, which means they are mitigating the access of other religious traditions and expressions of faith to government power. So it's, you can't have one without the other. Uh, and and I don't think that uh, I, I think the attempts to try to tear down the wall of separation between church and state are remarkably corrosive and are entirely about Christians trying to claw back some of the power that they've been losing as we have become more secular and as we have come closer and closer to the aspirational goal of that separation of church and state where we're not there yet. We're getting closer, I believe. And I think that freaks Christians out because they feel like they're losing power. And so these are attempts to, to try to claw back some of that power. Now you're a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. 
your church has a major, major role in the politics of the state of Utah. Yes, sir. Is that a good or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. Okay. Uh, it is, and this is one example of how religion meddling in, in government causes problems because we have all kinds of uh, folks in the state who are not members of the LDS church who are uh, minoritized and marginalized in a lot of ways in uh, exercising their religion in the access to uh, public uh, resources uh, and power. And so uh, it privileges folks who are members uh, of my church. And, and we see it all the time in legislative sessions where someone will advance legislation and it will come out that these are church lobbyists who are uh, influencing the crafting of this legislation and the wording and in ways that directly serve the interests of the institutional church. And so I, I think it is incredibly corrosive. And I think our the legislators who facilitate this and even seek out the guidance of the church in coming up with uh, and voting on legislation are are unfit for office. It's it's honestly an embarrassment. I can recall learning in civics classes as far back as they went, going all the way through high school up into college, being in awe of the kinds of people who could have the maturity, the discipline, the wisdom to structure and run a country. And I just thought, wow, what incredible people. And then I, uh, I grew up and got to know many of those people and got to watch them work and, and just embarrassed at the lack of integrity, at the lack of discipline, at the lack of wisdom of so many people who are responsible for governing the lives of millions of people in my state. It is embarrassing how bad these people are at their job. And they are there because they serve the interests of, of, uh, of their party bosses. And that's how they get into office. That's how they stay into office. And <laughs> so and it's something that go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it's, it's something that bothers me to no end. Yeah, I could tell, you know, I really wish you would express <laughs> yourself a lot better, but no, I'm serious. <laughs> I know I get it. it. It's so let me throw an analogy and see if it's comparative. Right. So okay. me being an African-American, I remember mm -hmm. when I was first running for office, one of the things that people used to ask me was, are you a member or a life member of the NAACP? Because if you weren't, especially being young, if you if you weren't, it's like, oh, well, you're not really serious. You're not committed to the community and all that. So mm -hmm. is being part of the LDS kind of like that? Is that something that is like, are you are you an LDS member? If you're not, I don't know if we should vote for you. I mean, is it is it like that in Utah? It can be like that. Uh, there are, I think there are a number of legislators who maintain um, membership in the LDS church because it gives them, uh, it is a credibility enhancing display. It allows them to maintain that connection with a lot of their constituency that might grow suspicious of them because I think there are a lot of members of the LDS church who look at folks who are, uh, you know, not necessarily avowed atheists, but if they are ex-members of the church or if they're not members of the church, it's, it's not necessarily that they view them with suspicion, but they think you're not one of me. You're not going to be able to serve my interests without thinking about the fact that if they're, if they're directly serving your interests because you're a member of the same group, there are other groups out there whose interests are going neglected. Um, and so it's, it's, I, I think our voting public is more concerned with trying to, generate a legislature that feels more like them, that, that will support them uh, and are not worried about some of the principles upon which the nation was founded, namely that we ought to be looking out for everybody, the, uh, the public interest, as, uh, as some of the founders used to talk about public virtue, which was, I'm not interested, I'm, I'm not out to serve my own interests, I'm out to serve the interests of the common good 
Uh, and that, unfortunately, uh, I think George Washington uh, was a general during the Revolutionary War, came into that believing in public virtue, came out the other end of the Revolutionary War and said, there ain't no public virtue anywhere. <laughs> and um, it was very, uh, very dejected by by that experience. Um, and so, unfortunately, I, I think that just gets more and more confirmed every every election cycle as we see that it's not public virtue that guides what we want to call a republic. Uh, it is um, interest in structuring power. So if you were an elected official, mm -hmm. how would your faith guide you? Now, before you answer, let me say from my perspective, uh, I grew up Lutheran and mm -hmm. uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, to be specific. And uh, so I was shaped up until I was like 22 uh, in, in that in that regard, uh, maybe a little longer. Um, but then I started going to non-denominational churches and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I remember when I first ran for the legislature, the 4th of July fell on a Sunday. And so I'm at, I'm at a church, you know, asking for votes and all that kind of stuff, but attending the service and mm -hmm. the, and the pastor devoted his sermon to talk about Paul, Paul's admonishment to Timothy about praying for leaders. And that was really kind of his, just that, you know, we have, uh, you know, he acknowledged me being in the audience and he said, we need to pray for him and, and, and anybody else that seeks office as well as serving, right? And mm -hmm. I felt that was important because I look at my faith as, as a balance kind of thing, right? Um, when we had the debate about same-sex marriage, and I was in Mississippi in, uh, uh, during that time, so it was like 2004, I guess, mm -hmm. and they were talking about putting the ban on the ballot. And I voted against it. And so there were a number of people who knew about, you know, my faith and all that stuff. And some even thought I was a preacher at, at some point in time in my life. Mm -hmm. And they were shocked that I was not only voted against it, but I was vocal about it. And I told mm -hmm. them, I said, my faith is my faith. But when I took my oath, right, to serve the people of the state of Mississippi, and especially my district, I distinctly remember that the U.S. Constitution and the state of Mississippi Constitution are not additional books to the Bible. <laughs> so I took an oath to uphold those laws and how I deal with stuff, issues like that in my faith is really my business. And I'm not going to project that out because, as you said, the goal is to look at the whole instead of looking at a particular interest. So I did that to qualify me. What mm -hmm. would you do? I, I think I would do something very similar, point out that in, in the capacity as a legislator, the priority is, is not advancing your own personal interests, but setting them aside in the interest of serving the whole. And, uh, but I think there would still be ways that my faith would influence um, things, and, and particularly those aspects of the faith that are not so much aimed at boundary maintenance and at structuring power, because there are ways we use faith to project out, to signal to others our fidelity and to curate the boundaries of our faith. And then there are other ways that we engage in these things to look beyond the boundaries of our faith. And, and you can, I, I believe throughout the Bible, you can find expressions of both insularity and ethnocentrism as well as universalism. And so I would give priority in my capacity as a legislator to those aspects of my faith that prioritize loving one's neighbor, that prioritize treating the immigrant uh, as, uh, as a native person, uh, that prioritize uh, helping the needy and the downtrodden and the oppressed and the poor and the widow and the orphan and all of those things. And unfortunately, what I see is a lot of nationalism that sets aside those features of the faith in the interests of those features that 
are are more clearly directed at ensuring shoring up a power base and ensuring that our boundaries are clear and uh, and marked and that we have good control over them. Uh, and and so I, I think there's room within uh, a biblical expression of faith, however that may take shape in one's mind, to uh, to contribute to the actual goals of uh, of good governance. Uh, and then I think there are other ways that are um, contraindicated that are directly opposed to those interests. Uh, and and I think. We have too many people in the nation right now that are prioritizing the latter uh, mm -hmm. and not enough uh, of the former. Amen to that. Um, all right. So now I want you to really get cerebral uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, explain eschatology. Uh, let me see if I can get eschatology <laughs> to our listeners. So uh, eschatology comes from a word uh, eschaton, which which basically means the end, the end times. So it's a reference to ideologies, beliefs about uh, the world drawing to an end. And usually it uh, from a biblical perspective, it has to do with ideas about God coming in and engaging in some kind of final battle against the forces of evil and God overcomes and then there is some kind of resolution, there is some kind of peace, there is some kind of victory that is enjoyed by the people who have followed God. And this is something that has uh, existed for about 2,500 years. We first start to see this kind of stuff pop up in what we call apocalyptic literature uh, within early Judaism um, during shortly after the exile. Uh, and then we get things like the book of Daniel, which is one of the most clear expressions of apocalypticism uh, in the ancient world. Uh, and then the book of Revelation is one of the clearest expressions from the Christian tradition. Uh, although most Christians were opposed to the book of Revelation for generations uh, until its inclusion in the canon became kind of uh, the sticking point for uh, some leadership within the church who who saw it as a very helpful book. And and ever since then, there have been different ways people have approached eschatology and how to understand what all this means for us. And whether this is about things that happened in the past, whether this is about things that are going to happen in the future, whether it's all a big metaphor that we're supposed to use to understand the world around us at any given moment and our place within it. Uh, but it's a pretty broad, <laughs> pretty broad topic that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but fundamentally addresses uh, the, the end of the world. So do you think that eschatology is shaping our foreign policy specifically with what is going on in the Israeli Hamas conflict? I think there are a lot of different ways policy is being produced right now. We have a lot of um, people on the ground who are engaging in this policy, I believe, in, in more constructive ways. But unfortunately, yes, particularly within Congress, I think there are folks, and I think it, it bubbles to the surface a lot more uh, commonly within state legislatures rather than among the, the folks in, um, in D.C. who um, are more instrumental in the development of this policy. But there seems to be a lot of rhetoric aimed at understanding what's going on in Israel in terms of um, this kind of final battle that's supposed to go on. And so... It is a it is having more of an influence than I am comfortable with because it tokenizes Israel in a lot of ways. It is a supersessionist approach that treats Israel as subordinate to Christian interests and as in need of conversion and salvation. I see a lot of it's it's primarily local and state legislators saying things about how um, Israel needs to convert to Christianity and that's how they're going to find deliverance and salvation. And that's how this is all going to end. And I think that's phenomenally harmful because it means we're not really looking for solutions to the actual problem. Uh, we're just waiting for God to show up to, uh, to solve things. And I don't think a lot of the decisions that are being made most close to or the closest to the action, the closest to the actual problem are being guided by that. But there sure is a lot of rhetoric about that kind of stuff that is inching closer and closer to the problem. Um, so I, I hope it's not influencing things. You know, because it was kind of scary when 
you know, I saw one week you had like thousands of Palestinian or people that were supporting uh, Palestinian positions march mm-hmm. up to the Capitol. And then, you know, the next week it was, it was, you know, a bunch of pro-Israel folks. But the pro-Israel folks scared me more than the pro-Palestinian folks because, you know, you had people like Pastor Hagee uh, out there. And anytime that he is involved in anything, I'm like going, oh, here we go. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and what was scary was that you had, it was bipartisan. You had Akeem Jeffries on that program and you had Mike Johnson on the program. And then here comes Hagee. And I already know that he practices that form of eschatology that is like, yeah, you know, we want, we want this to happen. We want this to blow yeah. up. We want the world to end so we can have the rapture and all this yeah. stuff. And I'm like going, first of all, I just try to figure out who goes to this church. Why would you want to go <laughs> to a church that wants to see the world end? I just, yeah, I don't, I don't get all that, but that, that, that's, a, that was kind of the motive behind my question because I'm like, you know, these people have great influence in these people in power. Uh, you know, Hagee, I think, introduced Nikki Haley at a function. So it's yeah. like those kind of people are trying to put people in office that think like that. And 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 my concern would be uh, if we gave somebody that thought like that the power of the the nuclear code that mm-hmm. you know we're screwed so i mean yeah. that's just that's just me how, how, do, how do you am i am i justified in my paranoia or <laughs> <laughs> i i i think absolutely i think if we had the kinds of um that christian zionism uh that you're talking about i i don't think is is zionism in the interests of the of the people of israel it's zionism in the interests of Christian eschatology. It uh, and and so it's looking out for the interests of of Christianity. And if we had you know back during the the Bay of Pigs and everything that that went on in the '60s, if we had ideologues, dogmatists like that who were looking forward to these events because it meant they got a front row seat to the end of the world and to God's deliverance, I think things could have turned out far worse than they did. But we had cooler heads that prevailed that were there trying to make sure these things didn't happen. And so the last thing we need is people with their fingers on the switches who sincerely want these things to happen. That is horrifying to me. So I agree with you that that's that is discomforting. So how should we as citizens balance our faith with our expectations for government? I think that that's a great question. Um, I think we spend an awful lot of time trying to think about the purpose, the origin, the nature of our government, not on the terms that it actually developed, but on terms that are meaningful and useful to us. And what that means is we've got to reshape it. We've got to make it into something in our image. Because uh, the folks who talk about the founding of America today and say things like, oh, they never intended for the separation of church and state, that is just a historical, that is not supported by any data, that is false. But they're remaking things in their image. And I think if, if people who, who think that they're, believe that their faith ought to um, be formative in their understanding of, of the nation and, and the role of the nation and their place within it, I, I think some critical thought is is the first thing that that everybody needs. Instead of trying to trying to figure out why our nation is here and why we're a part of this nation in a way that is meaningful and and useful to our our dogmas and our, our ideologies today, if if we could take some time to try to figure out more critically what the project they were trying to do. Um, so many years ago, and realize that 
you know, that may not feel very relevant to us. In fact, it may conflict with our, our priorities and our ideologies today. But I think some critical thought will help us to better understand what they were doing on their own terms instead of trying to um, force them to fit our terms. And, and I think that's what we need any time that we're trying to figure out how to run a country that considers everybody's needs and interests to be equal and then has to move forward from there. But if we're always just after our own needs, we're already undermining the intent of um, the founders of the nation. And so I, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a tricky question. And I think the circumstances are going to continuously change in the future and what we're going to need to do to in response to those circumstances is going to continuously need to change but if we could set our own needs aside for a while and just try to figure out um how the country is or the the country's own terms and try to respect those i think that would go a long way but that's also one of the last things on the list of priorities of folks who are who are interested in trying to, uh, well, who are who might be described as Christian nationalists who think Christianity ought to be governing uh, how the nation is run. I wish I had a better answer on that question because well, it's such I mean, an important one. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It, it you know, it's 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 interesting. I, I think about when you say the founding fathers, you know, uh, and some people criticize me for using that term but it is what it is these were the guys that locked themselves in a building in the middle of the summer uh and came up with uh a declaration of independence for one and then mm -hmm. they did it again because they were violating the rules of the articles confederation to sit there and come up with a new constitution and in secret, they, they didn't yeah. tell anybody they were doing it either. Right, that's what I'm saying. They boarded up the windows and, it, you know, they didn't have air conditioning back then, so they were making it even <laughs> worse with their outfits and all that stuff. But, you know, a guy named Governor Morris wrote this little introduction to the Constitution that basically said that we could walk and chew gum at the same time. We could protect individual <laughs> liberty and promote the general welfare. And yeah. I always use that as my guide. And I just, I just wish that people it doesn't matter what faith you are would be more in tune with what would make my neighborhood better as opposed to just focused in on what's going on in my house. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think Absolutely. that, you know, there's certain tenets of my faith that push for that kind of thinking. And I, you know, but I, I, I appreciate your answer because it basically said, Hey, look, you know, maybe we should you maybe we should put more thought into it instead of more emotion. Um, and I think that's been driving our politics, emotion more so than than thought. Agreed. And and I think that you make an interesting point about about uh, expanding the scope of our concern beyond our own household to the community around us. And this is something that there's a there's a religious dimension to this as well. I think a lot of people prioritize the the vertical relationship within religion my relationship to God and their concern primarily with what's going on in that relationship to the exclusion of all else. But that's why there were two great commandments though. One is to love God with all your uh, heart, might, and mind. Uh, and the other was to love your neighbor as yourself, which is the horizontal relationship. And I think when, if we prioritize the vertical relationship to the exclusion of the horizontal, we're not advancing uh, the interests of the people around us. Uh, we're just trying to look out for our own needs. And so I, I think it's a, it's a fuller expression of at least a Christian worldview to actually expand the scope of our concern beyond our household, beyond our own relationship with God, and worry about the well-being of the people in the houses next to us and the houses down the street. And heaven forbid the houses uh, that are down in the apartment complexes or over in the projects or the people who don't have houses. Uh, those are, those are circumstances. The people who live around me couldn't care less about uh, most days of the week. And, uh, and I think that's a problem. 
So Dan, how can how can people reach out to you? Uh, you know, you got websites, you got podcasts, you got what you got going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I host the uh, the Data Over Dogma podcast with uh, with my friend Dan Beecher that we have a, a weekly episodes on. I I have a, a unique username. It's pronounced McClellan, just like my last name, but it's spelled M A K L E L A N. That's a phonetic spelling of my last name that I used when I lived in South America. Uh, and so I, I go by McClellan on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Blue Sky, on Threads, and even on YouTube, uh, where I'm posting every day. So there's always something out there for me. And then uh, I teach online classes uh, as well at McClellan.org. And then there's a, a group of scholars I'm teaching classes with uh, at didascaloi.com, D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-O-I. Dot com. That's just a fancy Greek word that means teachers. And we should have probably, we should have thought of a better name, but that's what we came up with. So that's what's on the uh, incorporation uh, documentation. So that's, that's what we're sticking with for now. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm all over the internet. So uh, if somebody's looking for me, they should be able to find me without too much trouble. All right, Dan. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, I really, I really think, uh, the listeners uh, will appreciate uh, what you've said and uh, hopefully we'll take it to heart. We'll just, we just keep working. Well, I appreciate the time and the invitation and the wonderful questions. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. All right, guys. And we're going to catch y'all on the other side. All right. And so we are back. So you can tell that Dan McClellan is a deep brother. <laughs> he, he, he knows this stuff. He eats, sleeps, dreams about this stuff. And it's vital for our conversation, especially with the intersection of religion and politics. So I encourage y'all to follow him. And he loves interacting. So you got his handles on social media. You got questions, concerns. Hit him up and he'll respond. And uh, he'll, he'll definitely enjoy the dialogue. So now I want to get to our final guest. And the backstory behind this one is I saw this brother at homecoming. And I said, hey, man. I need to get you on the podcast. And he said, hit me up. Let's make it happen. And so here we are. Dr. Earl Joe Nelson Jr. is a school superintendent. Dr. Nelson has been in secondary education for 30 years. He has been named as one of the top three middle school principals in the United States by the National Association of Secondary School Principals. Joe Nelson was also deemed as an outstanding administrator as the Henry Drake Outstanding as he has received, excuse me, the Henry Drake Outstanding Administrator Award and the William Carey University Administrator of the Year Award. Nelson is also a graduate of Jackson State University, the I love, University of Southern Mississippi, and the Mississippi School Board Association's Perspective Superintendent Leadership Academy. He also has served on the board of Learning Forward Mississippi and is a past president of the Mississippi Association of Secondary School Principals and the Mississippi Association of School Administrators. Nelson has been featured in the book, Releasing Leadership Brilliance, and he was also featured in an educational film, Disrupting Poverty in Secondary School. Over the past 14 years, Nelson has been a leader in des des designing and facilitating cutting edge learning experiences for schools and administrators on topics such as cultural competence, leadership, and professional growth. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have as a guest on this podcast, Dr. Joe Nelson. All right, Dr. Joe Nelson. 
How you doing, brother? You doing all right? I'm doing well, sir. Another great day. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, normally, when I start these podcasts, I try to get a quote, either something that you may have said, something you may have written, something that relates to the work that you do. So this is your quote. Every student has a why and every parent has a why. And our job is to find out what that why is and help them accomplish it. Explain that quote to me. And so the key is for all of us is our why, because when we're doing the work that we do, the why is going to keep us on task to complete that work. Uh, this work in education is very tough work that we do to educate our kids and our communities, bring our kids out of poverty through K-12 education. The why is what's going to keep us on task. The why is going to keep us focused. The why is the key to everything. And everybody has a why. You have a why. I have a why. Kids have a why. Parents have a why. Teachers have a why. Administrators have a why. We have to discover the why and accomplish that. Yes, sir. Why did you seek a career in education? I mean, we we met at Jackson State University, the I love. And yes, sir. And but, you know, we all we all had our our ambitions as far as what we wanted to do. I kind of knew once I got to Jackson State that I was going to be in politics one way or the other. What was it that led you toward the path to be an educator? And so, Eric, I tried to run from it. You know, uh, both of my parents were educators. And I said to myself, watching my mother do aim playing back in the 70s and watching my dad be a high school and college basketball coach and, and winning games and championships and being a legendary. And uh, I said, I didn't want to do this work. And uh the, the key is don't ever say what you don't want to do because I still didn't know, as you knew with Jackson State, what you wanted to do. I didn't. I mean, I was finishing a degree, and I started looking at the pathways of some of the people who were finishing that same degree, and that that I felt like that wasn't going to be fun for me. That wasn't going to be my why. That wasn't going to get me get me there. And, uh, and so I had a high school assistant principal – that became a principal. He called me one day and said, Joe, I have a job in your area. I need you to come look. I immediately said no. And mm -hmm. then uh, it, uh, he called me again late May and said, Joe, I, before you say no, come and see it. And uh, I went to Biloxi and uh, the rest was history. My educational pathway started at that point. And man, I fell in love with it. And that was my why. You know, sometimes what you say you don't want to do, it's what you have passion for. And uh, starting as the best job I've had so far in my career was being a teacher and a coach because you can affect kids why right away. You know, put over 200 boys in college, boys and girls in college in 11 years, made 11 state appearances and won two state championships in Mississippi. That, that started my why. That yeah. started my passion for. Yeah, and and you you've been accomplished as, as we note in the um, in the intro, and you know just 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 the work that you've been able to do, not just on the sports field but on the academic field, which leads me yes, to this question: Talk to me about your experience in Clarksdale, being the superintendent for those public schools up there, and then after all that, why did you decide to accept a position in Lee County? And so go, going back to my why, part of my why again, Eric, is, you know, uh, was a coach and a teacher and went into administration, did some great things over in past Christian, had some of the top schools in the state of Mississippi uh, consecutive years, five years in a row, have a national blue ribbon school there. I was, I was in 2013, I was one of the top three middle school principals in the United States of America, you know, and so uh, got to you know, a good number of years and said, hey, I wanted to be a superintendent. You know, I wanted to affect thousands of lives and uh, I went to Clarksdale. You know, I was told, you know, by people don't go to Clarksdale. You know, it's bottom 5% in Mississippi, getting ready to be taken over by the state. 
But I said, if I can truly, Eric, go and make a difference in one of the lowest districts in Mississippi, you know, I can make a difference anywhere. And so I went there and uh, came superintendent in 2019 through COVID, brought them from the bottom 5% to above 11%. You know, and so that was a heck of an accomplishment. Um, you know, some of the things that, that, you know, buildings, you know, I got there and it was leaking in every building, put new roofs on all the buildings there, you know, uh, built a $7.5 million stadium there, you know, uh, through a bun and did some good work there. And, uh, you know, but when you have to make immediate changes, it's not popular. You're not, you're not a popular person. And so, you know, change sometimes equals success because you can't keep doing the same things you've always done. And I got there and changed the culture, uh, but, you know, I, I changed the job to friends program there as well. And, and, and so we needed people to come in and do what's best for kids, for kids' success. And a percentage of the district wasn't doing that. And so, so uh, got out started doing some consulting on my own based on my resume and uh, Lee County called me and I almost said no again uh, because I felt like I had a had enough but then also I felt like there were some things I still could be doing to to help educate kids and get kids to the next level by the thousands you know we have 2,500 students over here and uh, we made history here in my first year I got here they had two C's, two D's, and an F. We have four B schools. And this is the first time in history that they've had four B's. Uh, this is the first time in history they've had over one B. And so, Eric, that's some very hard work. That's some very tough, these are some very tough decisions you have to make. But those decisions that are made are best for children, not best for people. And so that, you know, some districts, they make decisions best for people, adults, you know, community. These decisions are made best for children to have success because if your children have success, your tax base is going to be great for you. It's going to be it's going to be dynamic. But we got to make the best decisions to make the, to build a tax base. Yeah. And I, I like the way that you phrased that jobs to friends program uh, that I, I might I might steal that one for, for some some yes, other sir. speeches down the road. Um how significant was the COVID ba- pandemic to public education? Like you said, you were a superintendent during that period. What What do you think? What was the immediate challenge, and then what do you think has been the after effects because of that? So the immediate challenge is we had to learn how to teach kids another way. You know, we we couldn't do face to face. You know, we. You know, the uh, electronic devices became a part of the educational process that will never go away. And so what we did in education prior to COVID and what we do now would never be the same. And so if you're thinking pre-COVID of how we did education, uh, you probably need to be heading to the door. You know, because now this digital learning platform is a huge platform. Uh, It's not for every child. But it is a platform that we have to recognize that we can do well in. I mean, even uh, meetings changed. We started doing more Zooms. And so Zooms were cost effective. We started doing more trainings digitally. You know, and so it it had a lot to do with the bottom line and budgets. And it it made a difference. And we'll never be the same. The digital market right now is a a huge error. Kids are are doing digital things beyond what we are teaching at this point. You know, AI is not going away. You know, coding is not going away. STEM and stream things are going, growing. There are 2.4 million jobs in the United States right now that are STEM related. And so we've got to educate our kids to the now. And so that leads me into, you know, I type, I think in not 23, I think in 2030. And so that's difficult because I'm a visionary. I know what's coming. And uh, I think about getting ahead of that to make a difference for our children in Mississippi. What's the, what is the biggest challenge in publication, right? Public education right now. What, What do you see as the biggest hurdle that you have to face? Funding. Funding is the biggest hurdle in Mississippi. 
over the last 10 years, every district has lost a thousand kids or better. And our buildings, Eric, were built in the 1950s. Some of them were built in the 1930s. And in communities, we're still holding on to pride in the name of the buildings in our communities. And we don't have the money to keep those old buildings up. In some cases, you know, we need those buildings to come off the book. We still paying insurance on them. And they are dilapidated. They are just hanging on. And so we have to uh, uh, educate to the now. You know, uh, here in Lee County, we have two high schools. We have a small high school, 712, with less than 300 kids. We have a 912 with 600 kids. But the inequities of what we take in both of those schools are quite alarming to me. And so I have to make a difference in that because all our kids have to have equal access and equity to grow together. It shouldn't be any separations in that based on my community, what I don't have in my community. So the real disparities are what we have in our communities well, versus funding and having that teacher capacity to bring those courses where kids can be successful in the United States. You know, workforce is a huge area right now. I mean, we are not supplying the workforce. You know, workforce development is huge right now. Skills that we have to teach kids, you know, and so uh, we, we, we've we got to move strong on the career side of it. Uh, my, my new phrase for that is articulate skill trade. You know, we have to come up with some articulate skill trades for students to be go to be able to go straight to work out of high school now. Nissan right now is adding EV here. They're gonna have over a thousand job openings. And then they have about a thousand people getting ready to retire. There's just one company. Ceasefire here has a thousand job openings for programmers right now. And so we gotta fuel that that market of the, our citizens to be taxpayers to go to work. So Explain a little bit. You you mentioned something about equity and um, and then you talked about the grading system. So the grading system is set up by the Mississippi uh, Department of Education, correct? Yes, sir. And that's that's something that they, you know, there's a standard that certain there's certain criteria that schools have to have to reach these particular grades. Um, talk about. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, so so there's some there's some real uh, inequities with our grading system, you know. So I've been through uh, this is probably my fifth grading system in my career. Uh, this grading system is based on growth of students, and it's based on proficiency, but also it's based on growth of the bottom of our kids. Um, the grading system before that was based on proficiency. Proficiency meaning every kid reading on grade level. And so in the United States, 36% of our kids in public schools are reading at proficiency. 36%. That's really alarming. That means that the rest of our kiddos are reading below grade level in the United States. You're talking about almost so two-thirds of almost two-thirds of the nation as far as yes, children sir. are concerned. Absolutely, in public schools. Wow. That's real alarming. And so we have to work on the literacy things. We have to teach teachers how to teach kids how to read. You know, the science of reading is very important. But we have to expose, and in, in our private communities, we have some ACEs that are against them. They don't have libraries at home. They don't have books. Mama, auntie, grandmama don't don't read to them. You know, they rely on us to do that at school. And then we have to get them to read and behave. Because reading behavior works hand in hand. And so we have to work on the literacy kinds of things to really get our kids to read. When I got to Carsdale, 70% of the kids there were reading one to two grade levels behind. 70%. That means 30% of them, you 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 follow the numbers, right? Yeah. That, that was a real tough task. And so we had to implement some literacy things to make a difference. Here in Lee County, we are are, are, are putting, uh, we're, we're building a building right now coming up. We're getting ready to break ground on hopefully next month on a pre-K because K 
kids have to come out of kindergarten reading. We're winning, Eric, if they're reading. If they can't read, we're in trouble. That's right. We're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you talk about the uh, the school to prison pipeline, you know, and, and like I said, one of the biggest things I learned when I was in the legislature was that we base prison beds off of who's reading at the third grade level at that particular point. So we're, we're anticipating in five years or more that these particular folks are not going to be productive citizens. They're going to be in jail. So it's really, right. really stress, uh, important to stress literacy in that regard. So I, you better than me, brother. I, I ain't going to lie to you. That's a, that's a heck of a challenge, especially. And that, that leads me to my next question. Do you think Mississippi has more hurdles than other states? Because like you said, nationally, only a little more than a third of our kids are proficient. So Mississippi being the poorest state in the nation, is that compounded? Uh, I think we've come a long ways. Uh, we're not on the bottom of the list any longer. Okay. Uh, I feel like we have a long ways to go. Our proficiencies are right now. We're right now. Uh, we're a little higher than the bottom. You know, we're, you know, 38 in some areas, in the 20 percentile in some areas ranking. Uh, we've come off the bottom, but we still have a ways to go when it comes to literacy. Uh, there's a real critical uh, need right now for teachers. There's a shortage of teachers across the United States, and and that's a challenge right now, <laughs> finding appropriate teachers uh, with a skill to teach. And um, <clears throat> and when I went into education, the the commitment that we made, you know, we signed a contract. It was like, you know, my grandfather and grandmother, my my dad said, when you shake a man's hand, and you agree to something, you stay with it. You know, this generation, man, the, you know, it's different. And we have to uh, enhance what we do to this generation. And a lot of people are not going to education, and that's a challenge for us, uh, keeping uh, this process alive. And then another part we have now is, <clears throat> they're thinking about letting kids go wherever to school, where, have a voucher to go to school wherever they want to go to school. That's going to be a problem for public schools. If I have a, a hundred kids that have a voucher that want to go to an academy or want to go to another school, that funding goes with it. And, uh, you know, that's a big thing right now politically that's being pushed in other states. And that's something that we have to deal with in Mississippi. Some of us in Mississippi still have old desegregation order, deseg orders. Uh, public schools do not look the same when those desegregation orders are written. And so those are some of the challenges that we face. And then the bottom line is I have to make this decision based on the funding that I have that's best for children. You know, we have some challenges with, uh, you know, with school boards. I can't make a decision here without my board support, you know. Um, you know, they hired me to be the superintendent. They're the board. Their jobs are to govern and create policy. And my job is to follow it. And so we have to write a lot of plans to the federal government, to our state government. And then we have to get those plans approved. And then I have to come back and give you the how. How are we going to do it? And then you got to trust that I can do that. And you can't look at the people's names on stuff and the amounts on stuff and saying, hey, I'm questioning the how. That means if you're questioning the how, that means you're questioning the process. And if you don't support the process, we cannot be successful. We cannot. Yeah. So that sounds like not only are you an administrator and in, in trying to implement stuff, but you're a lobbyist, right? Because you're yes. trying to convince these elected people or appointed people, however they're chosen, to to say, hey, look, you know, we need to do X, Y, and Z. If we need to get this money, we gotta we gotta have this kind of standard. And you gotta convince these folks who a lot of them are not educators by by profession and most of them are educated but a lot of them are not and so you're trying to talk to them and convince them hey this is what is best for the community not just today but down the road absolutely you know and, and when you sign up for this job that's not what you think that you're signing up for <laughs> but be careful what you ask for because you never know what you're gonna have and so you know, people look at our salaries and they think that they're 
played it, but they don't look at that I'm working 80, 90 hours a week. I can't sleep at night. You know, I'm, I, I mean, it's, this is not a nine to five. This is not an eight to five. This job is 24 hours, seven days a week. When I step out in the community, I am working. I'm working. When I step outside, I am working every day. And so, uh, you know, some real inequities of what that looks like in our state. And we really have to work on those things. Yeah. Well, I'm we in really a, have to, Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, those are some things that we really have to face the facts on. You know, the number of kids that we have in the district and our pay, you know, there's some real inequities of how that's done in Mississippi right now. Yeah, well, big controversy. I'm in Atlanta. Big controversy in Atlanta came up when they let go of the superintendent here, and then everybody found out that the superintendent made five times more than what the mayor made. And people were trying to say, well, how is that? You know, what, what's going on with that? Why, why is this person? But you kind of explained it. It's like, look, there's a lot of things that a superintendent has to do, even in a smaller sphere, just dealing with the public schools, than even a mayor would have to. That's one thing a mayor doesn't have to worry about because the superintendent is handling it. And in some cases, Eric, our budgets are higher than some cities' budgets. In some cases. You know, but here again, we we the number of folks that we serve in, I know they're serving the city and that population should be higher than our school population. Uh, but here again, the, the 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 levels of what we're serving are somewhat greater because we are fueling the tax base and we really have to work together in that sense. You know, so I'm not a mayor. I wouldn't dare tell our mayor here what to do. That's not my expert. I, that, I'm not an expert in that area, you know, but we do have some mayors that, that dictate what we are supposed to be doing. And that's not my lane. I'm, I'm not a board member. And so I stay in my lane. I don't want to be a board member. I hope they don't want to be a superintendent. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, here again, but I do know for my mayor, uh, as I spoke with my mayor about it's my job to infuse the tax of your city how do we do that we got to have great accountability i got to have a high graduation rate and and we got to get kids to work and some kids will stay here and some kids will leave i said but some folks are going to come back based on if i do a good job of getting them to a tax base that's suitable for their lives for the rest of their lives i mean you got to think about it eric I don't know about mayors, but we got the most important jobs in America. These are the future doctors, the lawyers, future broadcasters, the future of politicians, the future of everything we hold in our hands. We hold that. It starts with education. It starts back when we was at Jackson State and we didn't know what we wanted to do. Some of us did, some of us didn't. But but, but, but we started somewhere and someone had to, some educator had to infuse something in you or I to be successful, to be where we are right now. Amen. That's the bottom line. That's right. So real quick, cause I know you, you're pressed for time, but I, I, I got a couple more questions I want to get in. And yes, sir. I, I think you might've answered the last one, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and get this one in. Have you experienced any, any, any of the challenges that we see in other States, like these moms for liberties, book bands and all that stuff and as a professional what what is your take about all this kind of political activity that's going on with these school boards and book bands and all that stuff so so eric i'm a i'm a strong believer in uh evidence-based research you know there's evidence-based research that that things work in our poverty schools in america in mississippi I mean, here again, those particular organizations have an angle of what they have a mission of what they have to accomplish. But we had to find a way to co-mingle for our missions for our kids to a level of success. I understand some of their missions and some of the things that their challenges they're they're facing, but we're facing all the challenges. We have to find ways to coexist, to work together for the success of our kids. And we can do that. We can do that together. I mean, we're we're we are regulated by policy and law. 
I cannot do anything outside of what the law says and what policy says. You know, and here again, and we have some policies put in place with those organizations being a part of the forefront, and it's going to be success for our kids. Let's do that together, not against each other. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Do you think that um, with, with these counter agendas, um, you, you said a spirit of cooperation. Do you think that people come in with a spirit of cooperation or are they coming in demanding saying, Hey, we want this off the shelf or we don't want this history being taught and all that kind of stuff. How, how do you perceive how these folks are coming? I mean, it's based on certain communities. History is being taught based on what certain communities want and certain communities don't want. And so I, I think there's some individualities based on communities. Is that best for our kids? You know, you know, here again, we, we teach a standard. Those standards are already set. We know some of the parameters in those standards. And outside of that, you know, there's those other issues, you know, there, there's critical race theory. We don't even teach things uh, in that level in our state right now, you know. And so I think those decisions are based on individual areas and individual communities that uh, and it doesn't represent our our whole communities. That may only be one fourth of our communities uh, that that have a problem with some of the things that we're bringing in public education. That's that's a real issue. That's a real issue. And that's an issue that we need to 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 examine and look at our standards and see what we're teaching and make some decisions together to help kids. You know, public school doesn't even look the same as it did prior to COVID. You know, uh, a lot of kids are homeschooling. A lot of kids are in private school. A lot of kids in charter. So there's a lot of other things going on you know, with how schooling is done. But in public schools, we're regulated to a standard, to policy, and to law. And that's the only thing we can do. So with all those challenges, last question, what is your daily motivation? What gets you up during the day uh, to keep pushing for education for our children? So it goes back to my why. You know, I know that at one high school, I have 145 seniors. At another high school, I got 30 seniors. And so I have right at about 180 seniors. And my motivation every day is I want to know how many of those seniors are going to continue their education, going on to senior college or community college. How many of those seniors are going to enlist? How many of those seniors are, are going straight to work? And how many of those seniors are going to be entrepreneurs? I want to know that all 180 of my seniors are going to fit in one of those categories. That's my motivation every day. And then that process will start over again because now I'm working with my juniors, my sophomores, and my freshmen, my eighth graders, my seventh graders, my sixth graders, my fifth graders, my K through fourth grade to assure that we are doing the things to get them to that level when they get to high school. Cause that just don't start in high school. That starts right in kindergarten. We're making some decisions in kindergarten that's going to impact that bottom line. That's my motivation every day. Knowing that those kids are going on to one of those things and they're going to have a level of success like no other. That's right. my why. All right, Dr. Nelson, how, how can people get in touch with you, find out more about what's going on in Lee County and, and all that kind of stuff? Well, you can get in contact with me by through email or, or by phone. Uh, my email address here is jnelson at leaksd.org. Our phone number is 228, I'm sorry, 601-267-4579. Uh, our website is Leak sd.org uh, you can contact us by website as well um, we have some magical things going on in Lee County we, we're looking at career clusters for the future we're looking at pathways for kids 
Um, we're looking at our course offerings to offer more courses for our students to have success. Uh, we're looking at working on us being at the top of our state in our area, but also at the top of the nation and some of the work we've done. Eric, we've done this work before in previous districts, so th this is not new work to us. We know what it takes to be a national Blue Ribbon school. And so our goal is to work towards that because all of our kids are achieving at a high level at that point. And then we have kids going on getting scholarships and getting job opportunities every day. And that's most important to us. And so here again, we're Leak County School District. You can find us at Leak sd.org dr joe nelson thank you brother for coming on happy holidays to you keep, man thank you for having me keep plugging happy holidays. anytime man anytime I'm, i look forward to working with you yes sir brother all right guys and we're going to catch y'all on the other side All right, so we are back, and again, length of the program, all that stuff, I'm not going to get into any commentary. If you want to hear any commentary about what's going on, please follow me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash moment with Eric Fleming. Please do that. Um, subscription's only a dollar, y'all. Keep saying that because I want y'all to to, to go ahead and, and, and take advantage of that. Um, and you know, just, just to support the podcast, cause you know, that's, that's how independent podcasts, you know, it's, it's, it's you're going to have to either come out of your own pocket or have some friends help you out. So I want my friends to help me out. Okay. All right. It's the holiday season. Let's give. <laughs> All right, guys, seriously though, uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And until next time.